Good morning, everyone, or good evening on this wonderful, great, fantastic. I was trying to do Richard. He came up with so many great adjectives to start the day, and it is a great day. We've uh, we've got a couple of people. I know they're. It's getting close, and it's the beginning that we're going to start seeing seafarers here, and we are so excited and. Uh, we just pray that you hang in there, and those that are even still waiting to get on a ship, I know of, of a couple, and uh, we're still praying for you. We will always be praying for you. We we pray for all our seafarers, and we love you, and we miss you, and we can't wait to see you here. It's going to be great, and uh, it's things are starting to move, and it's getting exciting. We've got some volunteers here today just in preparation and it's it's like we haven't done this in a long time and we miss you all and we can't wait and those that might be watching that are on other ships at other ports now but uh, we still miss you and we pray you're doing well and those that are still waiting just keep the faith and it's going it's going to happen we've got the the infamous Josh will be delivering the message and you know he always has a wonderful message that uh, from God and excited for that and I didn't ask who's the when Wendy is you know Wendy has a wonderful voice so it's an exciting day we pray that you stay strong stay encouraged things are happening God is awesome it's going to work out, so we can't wait. Until then, just stay positive and keep the faith. You know our love and prayers are always with you. And if we can ever do anything for you, please get in contact with the ministry. And just as a reminder, it's www.cpm at or dot life. Cpm dot life. I was doing the email. But uh, let us know anything we can do or just let us know how you're doing. So stay strong and let's have a word of prayer and then we'll hear Wendy's wonderful song. Lord, we, we thank you. Lord, it's getting exciting around here. We still have COVID issues to work out and just to be safe, but we pray that it continues to be safer and safer and just for the day that COVID is no more. And we can just welcome all the seafarers possible. Just, it is so exciting and uh, we miss them and we just want to encourage them in your word. This is all done for you. Uh, wonderful staff, wonderful volunteers, but it, it is not for the ministry, it is for you. And we just pray your blessing, for your blessings on this ministry. And we especially pray for your blessings and your love for their every seafarer's heart and soul. Just encourage them and know that you, you know, I pray they understand that they, they just come to the understanding of knowing how much you love them and you're with them. We thank you so much, Lord. And it's, we pray this prayer in your most loving and merciful name. Amen. Guides my 
my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. All right. Um, what a great way to open up. What a perfect song to just put us right in the attitude of worship, right? Um, that hope is our hearts cry. Um, and today is such an exciting day. We've you know, had people back in the center for the first time um, since the pandemic started. So we're so excited about that. If you're on the Mardi Gras and you're watching, we're looking forward to the next wave whenever you get off. Um, but you know, I always kind of like to start off with a little story or something just to kind of get your mind going. And this one might be more of me just rambling, but um, let me just get it started by going this way. Today we're going to be talking about Psalms 101, but just get our minds going. You know, reading this and I was thinking about, man, I'm a person that likes extreme things. You know, like I really like things that are just kind of live in extremes. Um, you know, and it made me think about art. My favorite artist is, is kind of cliche, um, is Jackson Pollock. You know, everything that he did was like expressive, you know, it was out there, it was random. Um, Peter Max, I love his like stuff from the 60s with all the crazy colors and just kind of psychedelic 60s looking like that. My The sports teams I love, I love to see the extremes, you know, like uh, in soccer, how athletic Chelsea is, but at the same time, they're, they play so beautifully and they pass it so well. And it's like everything they do is so extreme and opposite of each other. It just kind of fits really, really well in my mind. And, you know, like outside of that, um, I can get stuck on YouTube for hours watching people jump off cliffs and um, do crazy tricks on snowboards and just really push the extremes and just push boundaries to to where like you think the ceiling is like the perceived ceilings they just push it beyond and you're like wow that's crazy and you know the the reason I bring all this up is you know when you when you think about that perceived ceiling that's like as far as it could go right like that's the standard until you know in like a sport another human being comes along and pushes that standard a little bit farther than anything that's ever been done before. And my question, though, is like, what about concepts like that? Like, today we're going to talk about justice. Like, can you push justice to a farther way or, like, you know, to a point that you've never seen justice done before? Um, you know, what about, like, love, goodness, badness? All those terms, they're, they're really hard to define, right? And, you know, we don't really know how to describe them. We know what it is when we see it, but sometimes it's really hard to describe. And we live in a time where it's so far past post-modernity, it'd be like post-post-post-modernity that you don't really know how to label it because post-modernity, post-modernism is like the truth is relative. So if the truth is relative and we're past that multiple times, it's like, well, I hope what, you know, it's kind of hard to define anything because there is no standard. And that's, that's what I'm trying to bring out here is that when we, we, when we look at the world, there has to be absolutes. Um, and there has to be a standard. And with God, there is standards. Because if for him to exist, to God to, to exist, he has to be 100%, right? Like there has to be 100% God. There has to be... Uh, like all those concepts, like like when we say, well, we know what love is because God is 100% love or God is 100% good. That's what makes him holy, right? There is no bad. Um, so that's how we have 100% of that concept, how we can get it. That's how we can know those things when we see it. And, <clears throat> you know, anything that falls short of that standard of that 100% makes it bad. Even if it's 99% good, that 1% makes it bad, right? Because it's not 100% good. It changes it. Um, and so there, there's a standard that we see. And, you know, because if there's not, maybe what I call good, you may not call good. And, you know, you can't, you got to have something that we all agree upon that's undeniable. And so with that in mind, 
I think, you know, we can sometimes understand concepts, but understand them more fully when they are juxtaposed with their opposites. So today we're going to talk about mercy and justice, but it's, it's easier to understand justice, you know, whenever we compare it with mercy. You know, getting what you deserve compared to not getting what you deserve. And <clears throat> what some people might call a merit of grace, right? So um, turn with me to Psalms 101, and we are going to read that. It's only eight verses, so it's nice and short. Um, but in this, we're going to talk about justice, and we're going to see it right from the very beginning. So Psalm 101, it says this, I will sing of your love and justice, Lord. I will sing, or I will praise you with song. I will be careful to live a blameless life. When will you come and help me? I will lead a life of integrity in my own home. I will refuse to look at anything vile and vulgar. I hate all who deal crookedly. I will have nothing to do with them. I will reject, I will reject perverse ideas, and I will stay away from every evil. I will not tolerate people who slander their neighbors. I will not endure conceit and pride. I will search for faithful people and or I will search for faithful people to be my companions. Only those who are above reproach will be allowed to serve me. I will not allow deceivers to serve in my house and liars will not stay in my presence. My daily task will be to ferret out the wicked and free the city of the Lord from their grip. What I want us to do this morning is to kind of walk back through this passage, um, look at how the author David, how he sets up all the verses. You know, there, what's the one common thing? It starts off with I a lot. There's a lot of I in there, right? And I think that, you know, it's a great way for us to say, like, I want to be more like Christ. So maybe this is what this looks like. You know, that's the goal of sanctification, daily becoming more like Christ. But more than that, I believe we see David say, I, knowing like that if, if we replace that I with what's behind it, like that's his goal. If David's wanting to become more Christ-like, if David's wanting to more, become more godly, really the standard behind what he's saying, all of those things that I will do this, I will do this, it's because God is that perfected state. You know, like God is the embodiment of all of those things that he's saying. And so that's the standard. You know, we might call it the law. Are you in the Old Testament is the law. That is the standard, right? And so when we see all these things, this is what he's trying to do. This is what he's setting up. Understanding that is, is key here. And so um, understanding that mercy and um, that Understanding, like, okay, I will sing of your love and justice, Lord. Understanding that mercy will bring us to that I will in our own lives. When we look at God's justice, when we say, God, you have to judge, will bring us to the, Lord, I want to follow that in our lives. It will produce that attitude in us. And <clears throat> so let's kind of walk back through this and kind of just see what we have. Verse 1. Um, I will sing of your love and your justice. Lord, I will praise you with songs. Sing of mercy and justice. These two things together, again, they, they help us understand the attitude of worship, right? Because this is the heart of real worship here. This is what David's bringing out. God, I understand my wickedness before you. I understand my sin. Yet you save me by taking my spot on the cross. Now, David doesn't say that because Jesus hadn't come yet at this point, but we can say that now looking back um, from our perspective. David's looking forward to the Messiah, hoping that in God, that, Lord, I know your statutes, I know what you're going to do one day, that you have promised this Savior, and I will put my hope and trust, and now we're on the other side looking back, saying, God, you have done this for us. And it's not because of anything we've done, it's all because of what you've done that I will sing of your love and your justice. Verse 2, 
I will be careful to live a blameless life. When will you come to help me? I will lead a life of integrity in my own home. Of course, David would go on to sin again and again in his life. But we see here his heart, right? We're, we're supposed to be looking at that standard above. What is, what is he aiming at? It's that my heart is longing to live a blameless life and to walk in integrity. What is integrity? Integrity is what you do when nobody's looking. Are you going to act right when, it, when nobody could judge you? Here's the most important thing. It's not the blameless life that David needed. His actions aren't bear, bearing out his salvation. Like, his salvation doesn't depend on his actions, right? And what I'm trying to say is, like, actions don't lead to salvation. So his actions are, were born out of hope that he lived his life in, you know, the hope of the coming Messiah. So we see it in the further on in the book of James, right? Like, it's not, not about actions. It's about the faith and hope that you have. In the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, let's keep moving along. Verses 3 and 4. I will refuse to look at anything vile and vulgar. I hate all who deal crookedly. I will have nothing to do with them. I will reject, I will reject perverse ideas and, set, and stay away from every evil. I will have nothing <clears throat> wicked before my eyes. That's a simple little takeaway from that. What is behind this? I don't want to pervert anything. That is a part of God's standard, right? God, this is what you've defined. And if I introduce anything else in, inside of that whole thing, I've changed it. And God, that's not what you've wanted. It's looking at everything in life and saying, God, you have called this good. And because you've called this good, it is just and it will sustain me. You know, and I think sometimes we... We like to change that a little bit and say, well, I feel comfortable bringing this in here. I bring this in here. I bring in this. And it's kind of like losing your taste for something. If you, if, I don't know, like I, I used to love tomatoes and I would eat like tomato sandwiches all the time. And I ate them so much that I got sores in my mouth. And now I don't really like tomatoes. You know, and that, that's kind of how our conscience goes. When we start introducing things that we, at first, are like, okay, that's a little wrong. Eventually, we just kind of, it becomes part of our life. You know, like, we, we allow it to become part of that standard. We introduced it, and now it's, it's part of this system, and it's not what God originally had for it. And so, basically, what he's saying is, in verse 3 and 4, God, I don't, I don't want to call anything outside of your standard good. Because eventually this is what I'm going to do with it. I will turn it into part of this system, and eventually I will raise it up, and it will become an idol. No matter what it is. It can be anything good. You know, we do it with all types of things in our lives. Um, you know, money, um, sex, all of these things that, that are good things. God created us to have these things. But he created us to have them inside of what he has called good, right? Like sex should be inside of marriage. Um, m money should not rule our lives. But yet we, we have a way of turning it into an idol. And so that's, the, that's what we see there, that I will not have anything wicked before my eyes. Verse 5, I will not tolerate people who slander their neighbors. I will not endure conceit and pride. I will not tolerate people who treat others wrongly. Right, this sounds like um, the golden rule, right? But what's neat, the Chaldean translation. So when um, they were um, exiled, the Babylonians, another name for the Chaldeans, um, when they translated this into their language, it has a really neat um, definition. It means triple tone, um, and what that meant was like. When, when you are treating someone or you're slandering someone, and that's really the word that's used in English, slander people, but what does that do? What does a triple-tongued person do? It means that you are hurting the person that you're talking about. You're hurting the person who's being told about the person that you're talking about. 
and it hurts you. Who's slandering that person? So all three parties are being hurt in this thing. And the connotation behind it in, in the Chaldean translation is that the, the wounds that this creates of being triple-tongued, they're fatal. It's like you're poisoning all three people. And I just think that's interesting that that's how much, that's how deep they say that slandering someone is, you know, talking bad behind someone's back. When you treat your neighbor wrongly, you are hurting every possible party. And ultimately, the point is that God's standard of how we treat, treat others is that you should treat them how you want to be treated. That's, that's, like I said, going back to the golden rule. But it's also a great sin in those days in that culture in Jewish culture, to not take care of your neighbor. You know, people were expected to be decent. You were supposed to take people in. You are supposed to meet their needs. You needed to be a good neighbor. That's why the Good Samaritan, that parable, is such a big deal and why it would have been, like, almost offensive in Jesus' day that when whenever he teaches, like, oh, man, all the Jews, the rabbi didn't help, the Jewish guy didn't help, but the Samaritan, the one that, should be their enemy. He helped him. Wild. And God wants us to treat us, treat each other like we were all created in God's image. You know, we're all each other's neighbors. And so, verses six through eight, let's just keep going through. I will search for faithful people to be my companions. Only those who are above reproach will be allowed to serve with me. I will not allow deceivers to serve my house, and liars will not stay in my presence. My daily task will be to ferret out the wicked and free the city of the Lord from their grip. The people David would choose would be faithful people, is what we see here. And those above reproach, the ones that were not deceivers, not liars, not wicked. Proverbs constantly warns about all those things, right? The book of Proverbs. And it talks... And really, when you put all those together, it kind of describes somebody that's foolish, right? Somebody that doesn't act above reproach. Somebody that just, um, you know, acts carelessly. Somebody that tries to trick people. Somebody that lies, that's not, that doesn't hold up their word. That's wicked. That's a fool. And this might just be a southern thing, but my dad always said this to us growing up. He said, if you lay with dogs, you're going to get fleas. You know, if you spend your time and your energy with people that push you into the wrong direction, that push you to wicked things, you're going to be in wicked things. It's just common sense, right? Um, you know, there's another famous saying, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. But it gets to this heart that if you surround yourself with people who push you to the throne of God, you will not be pushed to the hole of Satan. And so, just kind of to go back through everything real quick, here's what I think, really, if we, if we look at this passage, it's only eight verses. I think there's four things that we can take away. Like, how do we see God's justice here? How do we wrap all this up? One, I think we see God's perfect standard, even in a chaotic world. Two, and since God is holy, God can be trusted and his standard and his word will never change. And three, since God is the ultimate judge, one day he will inflict his judgment. And then the fourth thing is just this, that we can trust God's mercy because we know the seriousness of his wrath. Now when we look at the cross, that we know that Jesus had to die as our substitute. And so that's my wave of hope this morning that... um as we look at this passage, as <clears throat> we see it, it's kind of a challenge. Maybe go through it again, and, and where it says, I put your name, and say, God, is this my attitude? You know, or maybe don't even put your name, just really put yourself down there as I. Does this make sense for me that, Lord, I will sing of your love and justice? Am I doing that? I will be careful to live a blameless life. I will lead a life of integrity. I will refuse anything vile. I 
will hate all who deal crookedly. I will have nothing to do with them. I will reject perverse ideas and stay away from every evil and just keep going through looking at those things. Challenge yourself with that today. Is this the attitude of my heart? That's a serious thing to do. It takes time to do. But at the same time, I think that it will lead to a wave of hope. So that's what I leave you with today is just the challenge. Go out, do that. Um, we are excited that you have been here with us. Um, we thank you for joining us on here. We are excited to see you at the ministry. That is for sure. Um, as um, about an hour from now, another wave hopefully will come off. We would love to have you host you here. Um, it's nice and clean. Everything is ready um, for you to be here. So thanks for tuning in. We will see you again tomorrow as Richard gives you another wave of hope. So thanks for being here.